The power of blood, if you didn't know that was the sermon, the power of blood. I wanna talk about different kinds of power that exist in the world before I get to the power of blood. Worldly power, <clears throat> we see that, don't we? Worldly power, political power, generating billions of dollars, the involvement and the passion of millions of people, especially in our country, you know, elections coming up, but in all countries. Political power is wielded, is chased after, is sought, is prayed for, fought over. Political power exists in the world. Physical power of all kinds, like there's just old fashioned muscle power, nuclear power, electrical power, all used in servicing society's various needs. Many of you probably in some way serve, work for institutions that manage some kind of physical power. And then of course, military power used to aggress or defend needs we see that being exercised in the world, just open the paper, a newspaper or watch the news and we see military power being exercised all over the world, uh, trying to gain uh, certain advantages. There's mental power used to communicate, create, research, calculate, explain the world and the people uh, around us. Just a couple of examples. All of these types of power, and this is not an exhaustive list. I mean, uh, the power of persuasion. Here's another type of power. Uh, all of these types of power are seen and exercised, diligently sought after for good or evil in the world that we uh, live in. Digital power, I didn't even mention that one. I mean, digital power, the power of communication, the power of the media, all kinds of power that people exercise and seek after. And we could talk about these things, but I wanna talk about spiritual power. Spiritual power. Spiritual power is not visible, yet it, it is exercised in the world by some. For example, there's the power of God himself. Read Genesis 1 verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Talk about power. There's spiritual power from things unseen, all the things that are seen are made. And then of course, there's the power of the word of God itself. Paul talks about this, Romans 1, 16, the gospel is the power of God unto uh, salvation. And in Hebrews 4, verse 12, the writer says that uh, the word is sharper than any two-edged sword, comparing spiritual power to physical power and spiritual power, of course, being greater than the physical power. There's the power of prayer. Jesus talks about that in Matthew 7. Ask, he says, and it shall be given. There's power. We have the power to come before God and ask for what we need. And we're promised that God will give us what we need. All we have to do is ask, to seek, knock. And then there's the power of faith. In Mark 9, 23, Jesus says, all things are possible to him who believes. Think about that for a minute. All things are possible to him who believes. The power of faith. And then there's the type of power that I want to consider this morning, and that is the power of the blood of Christ. Appreciate Brother Perkins uh, devotional uh, at communion. We didn't talk to each other, we didn't compare notes, you know, and yet I was sitting there saying, wow, what a setup. He's just, he's teed it up for me. I just have to go forward now. The power of the blood of Christ. We can be a witness to the power of God, you know, like the miracles being performed by Moses for Pharaoh, for example, and we can be a witness uh, to the power of the word, you know, uh, listening to Jesus refute the Pharisees. And then there's the power of prayer. We're a witness to that. Jesus prayed over a few pieces of bread and fish and had enough food to feed uh, 5,000 people. And we are witness to the power of faith, the healing of the centurion's uh, uh, slave, uh, where Jesus was amazed. The only time he was ever amazed by human being 
is, is, is the, the time where he said to the centurion, ah, I've never seen, he was amazed. He said, I've never seen such faith in Israel. So we're witness to the power uh, of faith. But here's the point. Until we experience the power of the blood of Christ in our lives, we are merely spectators of spiritual power and not channels for spiritual power. Do you see the difference? You can be a witness to the spiritual power or you can be a channel for spiritual power. And until you've experienced the power of the blood of Christ, you're only a spectator. You're not a channel. So one cannot experience the power of the blood of Christ without knowing those things that it has the power to accomplish. In other words, what does it do? You know, we know what faith does, we know what the word does, you know, but what does the, the blood, what does it do? Well, first of all, the blood of Christ has the power to make peace between man and God. Paul says in Colossians 1.20, and through him, to him being Christ, to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And so the, the blood of Christ has the power to make peace between man and God. Ask yourselves, why do people suffer? Why is there guilt? Why do we feel doubt? Why, why do we feel shame sometimes? You know, someone gives us a legitimate compliment that because of something we've accomplished and we go, oh, no, 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 I don't do that. Why? Because down deep inside, there's a sense of shame many times. Some think it's because we've made mistakes or bad decisions or knowingly we've done things that we should not have done. And this causation is true, but it's incomplete. We have no peace of mind, not only because of our moral failures, but because these failings have broken apart our relationship with the only one whose approval is necessary for us to have. The only approval that counts, the only approval we need, the only approval that makes any difference is God's approval. Yes, it's always nice to have our father's approval. I mean, our dad, our mom, our brother, our big brother's approval, our boss's approval, but, 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 but unless we have God's approval, we don't have any peace. Have you ever not noticed that Nothing is worth doing until a broken friendship uh, that was caused by unkindness or insult is mended. Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever been on the, on the outs with somebody, a friend, a family member, just somebody, some, you spoke too quickly, you said something, it was awkward, you, know, you had a fender bender, something you know, that's between you. And until that thing is fixed so that there can be peace again, you, you just can't get into anything. Yes, you brush your teeth. Yes, you vacuum uh, the carpet. You go to work, you fix your car, you do all that stuff. But until that thing that you know is broken, that thing where you know there's, you know, there's, there's no peace there, until that's fixed, you can't enjoy anything. And that's with another human being. Imagine if you're having that experience with God. So the same, holds true for every person and God. Every sin we commit, every evil thought we entertain further breaks down our relationship between himself and ourselves. And this separation occurs between our spirit and his, whether we know it or not. That's the difficult thing, whether we realize it or not. Sometimes as believers, we understand that sin causes a break between ourselves and God, and it's painful. But there are many people who don't understand this idea and still feel the pain. They just don't know why. At least we as believers, we know why. 
In Isaiah 59 verse two, Isaiah says it very succinctly. He says, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. That's the essential problem. That's the thing that causes the vacuum inside, the pain inside, the unhappiness, the loneliness, the anxiety and fear and guilt that we feel are merely symptoms of one who needs to make up with God because he's the one we offend with our sins, whether they be sins against other people or the indulgences of our flesh in the things that are forbidden. Either way, he is the one that we become separated from. And so the natural answer or question is, what do we do to fix this problem? You see, with a, with a person that I'm separated from, there's always something I can say or something I can do to make things right. I can go and say, look, you know what I said before, I spoke too quickly, I, I, I was foolish, I apologize. You know, we, we do those type of things to kind of make peace, you know. But what can we offer to God that will make up for our disobedience and disbelief? Can we just apologize? Do we do penance? You see, this is what causes the pain and the fear and the anxiety. The terrible uh, truth that there is nothing we can do there's nothing we can offer. There's nothing that we can say that will make peace between ourselves and God. You, you, you can say, I'm sorry 10,000 times and it doesn't work with God. No power in this world can bring about that peace except the spiritual power that resides in the blood of Christ. That's the point. In Hebrews 9, Verse 12, the writer said, it was not with goats or calves blood, but with his own blood that he entered once and for all into the Holy of Holies, having won for us men eternal reconciliation with God. You take the word reconciliation out and you could put the word peace in and it means the same thing. It wasn't the millions of sacrifices over centuries that made peace with God. It wasn't the millions of prayers offered up asking forgiveness that actually made peace with him. It was the power of the blood of Christ that made peace between God and man. Hard for us to uh, understand because it's a spiritual uh, concept. This is the one of a kind power that the blood of Christ possesses. You see, it has the power to remove what separates us from God and thus brings us peace of mind, peace in my heart, peace in my spirit. And so I have a question that comes uh, when I consider all of this and it is the following. How does the blood of Christ bring peace? How does the blood of Christ bring peace? The answer, it has the power to purify. That's how it brings peace. The blood of Christ has the power to purify. It does so by being the purest offering possible made unto unto God. Peter talks about this in 1 Peter, he says, knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold, silver or gold being the most precious thing that he could come up with at the time. That's not what redeemed you. That's not what makes peace, silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. The most precious thing 
a human being could conceive of at the time when Peter was writing was silver and gold. And yet he said, these things, they perished. They're not worth anything in the spiritual realm. In the spiritual realm where God dwells, where our spirit dwells, where our angst dwells, the only thing that has value to God is the blood of Christ. Why? Because it is pure. The purest thing possible in this world. Because it is pure, because it is spotless, because it is sinless, because it is truly alive, because if the life is in the blood, then Jesus' blood had full life, and thus it is acceptable to God as an offering for sin. And sin is the obstacle in our quest for peace. My question is, how do I remove my sin so that my God and I can be at peace? And the answer is the blood of Christ removes my sin once and for all and permits me to have peace uh, with my God. In Matthew 26, Jesus says, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is being poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. In this world, we have a whole bunch of ways of trying to arrive at peace. Psychology, for example, helps explain our failures, our sins, using other words, I guess. And drugs or alcohol or other uh, similar substances help us forget our sins or dull our awareness of our sins. And denials help us avoid facing our sins. But only the blood of Christ poured out on the cross by the Son of God has the power to blot out our sins from God's sight and make us appear to him pure and spotless and without sin. And that's what I want. I don't want to be rich, be nice, but I don't want that. Uh, some people say, oh, you, nowadays, you know, if you take care of yourself, you, you can live to be 110. Oh no, God, please. And I don't just mean putting up with the aches and pains of growing old. I mean having to carry around the sinful flesh. I, I don't want to have to do that any longer than I need to. I'm tired of sin. I'm tired of it. When I was a young Christian, I thought when I become an older Christian, boy, I'll have this sin thing beaten. Yeah, that's the old people laughing right there. <laughs> Revelation 1.5, he says, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. By his blood. Therefore, to use uh, biblical imagery here, Washing in the pure blood of Christ makes us pure. It makes us clean. It removes our sins that cling to us and cause this estrangement from God who is the center of peace. So let's briefly review what we've talked about. The blood of Christ has the power to first bring peace between human beings and God and the power it has is the power to purify men and women of their sins. That's the core of the gospel. That's the secret uh, for a long time that people did not uh, understand. One other thing about the blood of Christ, the blood of Christ also has the power to purchase for us spiritual blessings. That's what the communion devotion was about. In Revelation chapter one, five and six, it says, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, he's the firstborn. We're the second, third, fourth, fifth, 10th, millionth 
born after him the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood, and he made us into a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever, amen. Did, did you hear what he said? He made us into a kingdom, that's the church, and we are priests to his God and Father. Can you imagine that? That we are priests to the God and Father? So we can say that the blood of Christ has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And so what are these blessings? What are they exactly? Well, first of all, the blood of Christ gives us eternal life. I'll say it a different way. It gives us eternity of life. Eternal, as you probably know, doesn't only refer to time. You know, eternal life going on forever, never ending. Yeah, it means that. But it also refers to a certain quality of life that we will experience in heaven. Jesus says, we'll be like the angels, Matthew 22, verses 29 and 30. We'll be like the angels, spirit beings. No appetite for food or physical things. Uh, not bound by time, not bound by dimension. We'll be like the angels. Um, uh, it also refers, as I say, to a quality of life that we will experience because we will be in the presence of God, 2 Corinthians 5, 8. Not to mention that the eternal life experience will never have to cope with the suffering that comes with death. How much stuff do we do each day that, that simply prepares us for death? Or tries to slow down, you know, the oncoming of death. Insurance is about death. Uh, health aids is about keeping death away. Food, uh, right kind of eating, you know, careful driving. All of this is to avoid, is to avoid death. Imagine a life, I'll say it another way. Imagine an existence, imagine a reality that never has to consider death in any shape or form, ever. That's eternal life. Uh, another blessing we receive from the blood of Christ is a guarantee of an eternity of being just like Jesus and with him without reference to sin. Every time I'm with Jesus in my prayers, most of those prayers have to do with my sins, with my failings. I'm either asking for forgiveness or thanking him for forgiveness. I'm either asking him to help me overcome the things that I can't overcome by myself, or asking him please to overlook this weakness or that weakness. Imagine having a relationship with Jesus that, does ha that has no reference to sin whatsoever. Imagine a life without remembrance of sin no remembrance of sin. I never think about sin. I don't ever remember sin. That's what eternal life is about. And, and the personal righteousness that is never compromised by sin. Uh, the very best act that you do with the best intentions always has a little, a little something in it, right? A little bit of pride, a little bit of selfishness. Sometimes it's not done as well as we could have done. It's not perfect. Imagine a life where everything is perfect. Where every thought is not compromised in any way. You know, there's no Lord's Supper in heaven. Every Lord's Day we take the Lord's Supper, why? We remember sin, we remember death, we remember how God has freed us from sin. 
There is no more of that in heaven. Why? Because there's no remembrance of sin in heaven. The blood of Christ guarantees us that in the future, we will never have to deal with sin ever again. I'm telling you now, there's no power in the world that makes this promise. There's no religion in the world other than Christianity that makes that promise. Let's summarize, shall we? I spoke of the power of God the power of prayer, the power of the word, faith. But none of these can be experienced without first experiencing the power of the blood of Christ. God, God in his greatness answered all prayers for help by giving us his word that for those who believe the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, could bring us peace, purity, and the promise of eternal life. Every one of us here are here today to remember this idea and to rejoice in this idea. Revelation uh, chapter uh, seven verses 14 to 17 talks about those who have experienced this power of the blood of Christ who have peace and purification and the promise because they have washed in the blood, as it says. In Acts 22, 16, it tells us that Saul, who later became Paul, was exhorted to do what? To be baptized and wash away his sins in the waters of baptism. In 1 Peter 3, 21, Peter teaches me that at baptism, my conscience is purified from sin and I can stand before God in peace and purity and confidence. Why is this so? Because we experience the power of the blood of Christ when our sins are washed away as we are baptized in his name. Acts chapter two, verse 38. Why is this so? because sins are washed by the blood at baptism and the first experience of Christianity is the realization that all sins are washed away by the blood of Christ at baptism. We've seen uh, younger uh, people uh, being baptized in the last uh, week or two. Uh, and you know, the, the, they, the, whoever is doing the baptizing gets a nice hug. Uh, uh, I've asked people uh, after they were baptized, well, what are you feeling? And the number one answer, relief, <laughs> relief. Oh, they say it in different ways. Uh, how do you feel? I feel great, I'm going to heaven. I feel great because that thing I did, that shame that I had is gone, it's forgiven. I feel wonderful because I don't have to be afraid anymore. I feel relieved that now my sins are forgiven and God is no longer angry with me and so on and so on and, and so on. So I ask you, are you struggling with sin, sinner? What is at your core when you feel, when you, when you peel away all the layers of self-defense? What's inside? Fear, guilt, shame? Stop fighting on your own. You'll never win. You'll never win. You'll never get rid of it by yourself. Do it God's way. Come, wash those sins away along with that guilt and fear in the blood of Christ by confessing his name and being baptized. Jesus himself says it, if you're not sure, Mark 16, 16, those who believe and are baptized will be saved. What about, what about you, Christian? What about your struggle with sin? Stop fighting with your own method. Do it God's way, confess your sin. First John 
chapter one, verses seven to nine, and trust in the blood of Jesus to continually forgive you and keep you pure in his sight. The blood of Jesus continues to flow over us. If I, if I can give you an image, wherever we go, the blood of Christ continues to flow over us, continues to keep us pure. Why? Because God knows that there won't be a single day that'll go by where we won't need his purifying blood to cleanse us. Day after day, it cleanses us. Day after day, it keeps us pure. Day after day, it gives us peace. No matter what is happening, the blood of Christ overwhelms anything else that is taking place. So let's, let's have the confidence that comes from knowing that the blood of Jesus is powerful enough to wash away our sins and to keep us pure in the sight of God for every single moment until he joyfully surprises us all with his appearance. And with this kind of confidence, we can live our lives totally for Christ. Without it, we merely flounder. Are you floundering? Are you lost? Are you not at peace? If so, please come now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.